these are pizzas uh, I made a couple years ago. Why did it come up? That's weird. That's strange. Uh, yeah, I <laughs> thought you actually have a real pizza there, bro. I mean, no, they, they were real, but they're not me here. jealous, they're man. Like, they were eaten a long, long time ago. One was vegan, and the other one was like nuts. So I was made them, you know, at my daughter's house. But I gotta yeah. tell you, there's nothing like New York pizza, though. Well, those pizzas I made. Oh, you, you made it yourself, yeah? I made it myself. Made oh, yeah. I, I forgot you're a health nut, dude. Well, yeah, okay. I'll take that. <laughs> you're, I mean, last time I saw you with the SF Salsa Congress and you're like gobbling walnuts and all that kind of shit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. Damn, that was a long time ago. Uh, dude. That was, a, that was a long time ago. Are you still in the game? Because I've been in this game for a long time, but I think you are much more longer than I am in the game. Well, you know, I took a, 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 a kind of a hiatus, you know, and um, yeah, I think, you know, when I reflect on it, I kind of regret it, uh, not, you know, staying on the circuit. Oh, yeah. Because, um, you know, things have changed, you know, I mean, things have evolved. Um, who knew that when you were blasting bachata music across my booth at the SF South of the Congress, that bachata would be as big as it is, right? I was so, one, you know, dude, I was one of the few who really believed it. <laughs> let me tell you, man, I was not, I'd be like, dude, this is the South of the Congress, not the bachata Congress. <laughs> and nobody knew the bachata Congress yet, you know? Uh, yeah, Ricardo, Ricardo and, and Michelle, had, man, Ricardo and Michelle, I was like, We'd like you to do bachata there, and we'd like you to do bachata in the lobby. I know people won't like it, but eventually they would. I was like, thanks, guys. <laughs> yeah, eventually. But well, look look at now, you know? I mean, uh, uh, bachata something else. is really, yeah, it's, it's pretty competitive now compared to salsa and, well, you know. Salsa has been on a plateau for a long time, bro. That's because there's nothing new. Uh, uh, and... Like, you know, you guys are from the old school. Uh, I was a beginner when you guys were doing things and, and you guys were my inspiration. And that was it. It's really an inspiration where the people we looked up to not only perform, uh, not only, you know, some of them competed, some of them didn't need to, but really hang in there and hang out there in the social uh, dance floor and just dance with everyone and here we here we were we were just shooting camera because we want to bring this video home and right. we'd like to copy all of your moves you know what i mean <laughs> no one is doing that now no it's a, it's a whole different scene now um you know the trajectory is um you know more on um i mean at at, at one point before the whole, um, you know, video taking of social dances and things like that, there was an abhorrence of it. There were, dancers were like, no, you know, don't take me, you know, don't, you don't have my permission. And, and there were a lot of them who would be ready to throw down. Well, there were, know? there was that moment. Uh, uh, I think it was <laughs> after the pros realized that they're being videotaped every time. And so, uh, you know, uh, and then they get surprised where some people look like them when they're dancing on the dance floor. Like, for example, Frankie Martinez, every Japanese and Asian country wanted to dance like Frankie Martinez. You know? Let me tell you, it wasn't just there. I mean, I, I can remember at many a Congress during the time when he really just kind of was, as far as Congresses were concerned, he was like the Prince of Salsa. Right. And there were tons of guys walking around with their jazz shoes stuck in their pocket. <laughs> That's Frankie Martinez. You know, and trying to be Frankie Martinez, his style, you know, because as it's we not, know. It, it, bro, it wasn't just jazz. It was like some of them are like Kung Fu shoes, bro. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The funny thing, though, I don't know if you know him, um, Dario, who used to go with me in the Congresses and, and, and help me in the booth. Um, I probably he, know his he, face. Yeah, yeah, he's a DJ now, and he DJs in, in LA, and he does teach classes, but um, I forget what he goes by, DG, I think is his, his DJ handler, uh, but he, uh, for about a year, yeah. he would bring a small suitcase full of jazz shoes, 
<laughs> oh, he was killing you, it. He was killing it. Was. He got smart. And not only did he get smart, he went to, a, he, like in LA, he found a place that would get, just getting rid of them. So he would <laughs> get them dirt cheap, you know? Oh man, but yeah. With to those of you that I, to those of you that just got in in this podcast, ladies and gentlemen, uh, my guest is an icon, <laughs> uh, not only in the New York area, but even in the LA area because he lived in the LA area for a while. He is called the Mambo Fellow, which I really like that name. Uh, that's what was one of the reason I contacted him back in the old days and brought him to the Bay Area. Did some workshop musicality. He's known for his musicality workshop when it comes to Latin music, breaking down uh, uh, instruments, timing. He was the only one doing that. Uh, uh, and it's, even to this day, I cannot name any people that are actually doing that, focusing on that alone. Most of them would touch on their workshop for like five minutes and that's it. But this guy <laughs> would talk about it with slides and all of that stuff for an hour or so, making it like a two day type of thing. Uh, Mike Bello, welcome, sir. Thank you, thank you. I'm glad uh, to be able to hang out with you for a little bit, especially since I haven't seen you in so long, you know? Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's, it's cool, it's cool. You lived in uh, Los Angeles for a while there, right? Yeah, um, I moved out there in, 90, uh, in 97. Yeah. And uh, when I actually moved out there, I was living with family up in the in the Antelope Valley. So up there near Santa Clarita, uh, you know, Palmdale, around there, you know. And um, yeah, we were there for like a few months. And then when we moved down to the valley uh, and uh, I lived in Tarzana for okay. a, lot of, a lot of that time. And while I was, you know, trying to get my fix, cause you know, there was no dancing while I was up in Palmdale. I did get online and I found Salsa Web, you yeah. know. So it Salsa Web basically was the only Salsa resource at right. the time. And uh, so I got connected with some of those people and I found where there was dancing and stuff like that. And um, yeah, I wound up living in LA. I moved a couple of times, but I wound up being in LA for about 13 years. That was kind of smart thing to do because as you know, LA is almost 100% on one type of dancing uh, and they call it here, it, they call it in Europe LA style now, not on one or anything, it's just LA right. style. But uh, <laughs> yeah. how was that like dude to, to introduce Mambo to uh, an area where it's predominantly the Vasquez brothers type of style? Yeah, that was a, that was a rude awakening. Um, you know, I came by, I remember like, I, you know, I hit like Sportsman's Laws and, and the Mayan, you know, and several other local places. And I was, um, I was surprised that I couldn't do certain things that I could do in New York. For example, like in New York, if I danced with someone that didn't dance on two, of course, I would, whatever, whatever timing they, I would be the following and I would just do, if they were on three, seven, whatever. Yeah, but then I, I I would do kind of a in close position. I would do a Cuban side charge and get them on two. They'd be dancing on two with me, so long as I didn't let them go. <laughs> so <laughs> we were in close position. We were dancing on two. As soon as I let them go, if I'm doing shines or whatever, if they could do shines, then it was you know it was whatever you know. Yeah, yeah. But when I got to LA, uh, I couldn't do that. If I did a side charge with some with a lady, her foot would go, but her body wouldn't. Correct. So she wouldn't commit the weight change. Yeah. And it was it was difficult for me. So I wound up having to stay on. I'm just gonna say on one, but it's anything but two, <laughs> you know. And uh, but excuse me, <clears throat> but I did find you know, a small group of people that, I, that could dance on two in LA. And so um, the breakthrough for me was that, um, it's so funny too, because I had this conversation just the other day about, you know, when you don't have something, in, you know, in, in your environment 
that you need or want you're passionate about, then, then you should do something about it. Create your community, create your yeah, environment. You exactly. Know? And so I was like, all right, I was DJing. I was DJing at this club in Marino Del Rey and uh, had just started there. And this lady was teaching a salsa class. I was, you know, I was hired to, to, to play salsa. So I was playing salsa music and this girl was teaching, you know, teaching a, a class. And, and as, as I was watching her, I was like, oh man, it's shaking my head. And uh, after the class, you know, we were talking and everything. And then I started showing her shines and I started showing her a couple of things. She goes, you know, you should be teaching that class. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, I'll do it. You know, if you don't, if you're, and that's how I got started teaching. And so the people that were coming eventually, you know, we're passing out flyers and things like that. Uh, I started getting a small group of people coming to the class. And then after a while, people would come to me from New York and they would come through the club. And then they would, like one time, um, Jimmy Anton came by with a bunch of his people. And they said, hey, you know, I'm DJing over here. And then they came while I was teaching my class and then they hung out and, you know, so it was like getting validated basically, right? Because I'm, I'm professing the two, I'm professing dancing to clave, a lot of people didn't even know what clave was talking about the tumbao and then i have these people come in and they all it was like maybe a dozen of them and they were all dancing on two yeah. so it was it was good so it didn't snowball it took a long time but eventually because i was on the scene i was pretty vocal especially on salsa web because i was on the chat boards and constantly talking about dancing on two the clave how it how it relates um, unfortunately, at that time, I didn't know anything other than the truth about the clave. That's it. Like, I didn't know right. how the rhythms relate. And I didn't know that. I just knew I had faith, like, like, like religion, you know, like, you know, um, I just knew that the clave was it and the tumbao was, you know, the way to stay in it, you know? True. And then fa fast forward a couple of years later, I, yeah. um, I got something unsolicited. I was sitting in the pool, uh, by, you know, we were living in this apartment complex, a gated complex, and I was sitting by the pool, mailman comes, and there's a small package for me. And I'm like, I wasn't expecting one. So I opened it up and it was a book. And it was, it was mind blowing. It was, it was called, it's called the, um, the essence of Afro-Cuban drum set the Afro-Cuban Percussion and Drum Set by Ed Uribe. And you know what? Hold on just one second. Yeah. All right, never mind. I thought I, I, thought I knew where the, where the book was real close, but I don't. Right, so anyway, it's, 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 it's an old book. I don't think that, that, that they sell that anymore, to be honest. Uh, I'm sure you could find it. Um, it actually came out the same year that I received it. It was it, it's published by Warner Brothers, and uh, I got it like 1998, 99, somewhere around there. Yeah. And uh, I just ate it up. Uh, fortunately for me, I have a small background in music, so I was able to read it, read the music understand the rhythms, the principles that this guy was talking about. It was geared towards uh, percussionists. Right. But that was my, that was my linchpin. That was my uh, launching pad uh, into uh, relating how, okay, we understand where, what's going on with the rhythms. Right. So this is how they correlate with dance. And so that's when I was starting to make my, you know, uh, I was starting to build my, my database, my own personal database on, on how to present this. And the first time I taught a class, it was an epic fail. It was like, you know, and I had somebody who was playing devil's advocate and kind of, you know, giving me, fortunately, a couple of students was like, kind of put their foot, you know, in the right place, you know, verbally. Um, but it was, it was a difficult you know, thing for me to do. But after a while, I kind of got a rhythm and uh, I feel good about it. You know, yeah. I feel good about my contribution to um, 
how people can understand rhythm without being a musician. I mean, what do you think of the music? Because I, I know you probably when you landed in LA, you heard a lot of commercial salsa, right? You heard a lot of commercial salsa music. Uh, probably rarely you would hear uh, El Gran Gombo or, or, or even uh, Spanish Harlem Orchestra for that matter. But what do you think, do you think it makes a difference in timing at, as a type of music as opposed to uh, with, you know, let's say El Gran Combo versus Oscar de Leon? Um, no, I don't. I think yeah. that, uh, you know, I think for the un, for the, for the, for the initiate, maybe, you know, because everything sounds the same and yeah. they're not, you know, um, I think that um, there are different feels in the music for me anyway, you know, right. um, I, I do have my preferences. Sometimes I prefer the much older stuff from the 60s and the 50s and, and things like that. Some of them are very short, uh, but they're so, mm -hmm. you know, they're so rich and so textured and, and make you what they just make you want to get up and, and move. You know? I mean, you know, you're like, it, it kind of makes sense to dance on to, for me, if I'm dancing to uh, El Gran Combo or, or, I don't know, Maxima, you know, it kind of makes sense, you know, uh, as opposed to dancing on one with uh, Victor Manuel, you know, all this is all, all this type of people. I tried dancing on two with mostly the commercial salsa. It just, it doesn't feel right. <laughs> That's just yeah, my point. Yeah. However, when I dance Cuban salsa, as you know, Cuban salsa is circular. I dance on two. And people yeah, get surprised, like, what are you dancing on? It's like, I'm dancing on two on Cuban salsa, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's different, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> So, I mean, that's, that's it. I mean, what are you up now? What are you up to nowadays? I know it's pandemic shit, but uh, before that, and, and what are your plans for after this pandemic? Because I know, I know I invited you to the Mambo Expo. Unfortunately, <laughs> I don't think yeah. it's going to happen this year, bro. <laughs> I don't think so either. Yeah, that's a, that's a done deal. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we'll do it next year. Not, nothing to yeah, worry because yeah. my yeah. contract with that hotel is three years. So. Oh, nice. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, nice. Yeah, they're gonna, they're gonna, they're gonna want your business. Well, yeah, there are. There right now, I get a lot of invite from hotels and emails and messages. Uh, nice. It's like you know, we'll give you discount. We don't have to give you attrition. It's like you don't understand. <laughs> no one's gonna show up. <laughs> right, right, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. T this year's a bust. Have so you I'm been? Have you been honing? your materials when it comes to the musicality workshop thing? Well, for me, the, the, the information has been kind of embedded in my pores. So like, you know, for example, the last, the last class I gave was at the last New York Salsa Congress, so almost a year ago. You yeah. Know? And before was that, that, it are, was- Are people it, still interested? Yeah, yeah, it was well attended, you know, and it was it was nice. Uh, my class wasn't uh, as big as it was in in past events, but the thing too is that you know how it is, um, you know, when you're not uh, when you're not seen, you're not remembered, you know, and uh, so I was basically just out there in the social scene, and that's all I was really doing. Periodically, I would teach a class here and there, you know, mostly on rhythm, you know. I didn't even try to teach dance classes because there's just there are too many instructors. It's yeah. too much too much of a competition. Yeah. Uh, but when it comes to rhythm, you know, um, I'm pretty much, um, you know, the only guy. You know. Um, do you uh, do you also teach instruments like the tumbao and, and and even bongos for that matter? Uh, no, not really. I mean, do you I bring can those up the up Sometimes I mean okay. I don't bring I don't I don't bring bongos but you know like I have a I have a pair of uh, uh, these uh, training excuse me my thing is not happening right here but you know I have this training uh, these training uh, congas that uh, sometimes I bring to you know either my own classes or certain events or what have you but um, 
Uh, no, I, the only thing I bring is hand percussion. So I may bring, you know, a cowbell, claves, maracas, you know, things like that. Right. Uh, I can teach the rhythms that are specific in salsa music that are the repeatable rhythms, you know, uh, that you can align yourself with the clave and, of course, aligning your on to dancing. Um, but no, I, I don't. I don't really teach. Uh, you know, percussion per se. You know. How essential is it as a dance teacher yourself when it comes to mumbo? How essential is it is counting when it comes to teaching a workshop or teaching even beginners for that matter, uh, as opposed to just relying on clave or you know, uh, congo or tumbao for that matter. Um, you mean when it comes to a rhythm class or when yeah. it comes to a dance, no, when a it dance comes class? to a dance class or a dance class, it really depends on your population and, 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 and what your frequency is with, with that population. Like if they're, if they're return students and, you know, and they're, they're there for the long haul, then I think that if you're, if you're a beginner, you come to my class, I'm teaching a dance class. I'm going, myself, I'm going to start with the tumbao and the clave as a point of reference. But then I'm going to relate to numbers because everyone can relate to numbers. Everyone. Right. It's universal. So when you apply the numbers to the, to the weight changes, to the dance pattern, then you could, you could start, you know, filtering in more and more of the rhythm uh, so that over time it starts to make sense. In my opinion, in the long haul, you know, you need the numbers to keep you in there. But once you learn rhythm, you don't need the numbers. So basically, you use, you use rhythms, and then you lose rhythm. I mean, right. you use numbers, and then you lose numbers. Right. Rhythm. And when you do that, I think I feel that you become more connected to yourself, to the music, to your partner, to the floor. Uh, those four things are important to make your experience, you know, uh, enjoyable. You know? I think the important thing for beginners, uh, and I've taught a lot of beginners, it's hard for them to find the one, the first beat, <laughs> and, uh, to be able to to guide them in that area. Once they they see or they realize or they could pinpoint the first beat, I think they're on their way. I mean, what do you think? Well, you know, I you know I've taught dancing on two a couple ways. Um, I, I'm not sure, I, I don't know if you're still familiar with classic and modern mambo, the timing differences. Yeah, I was, just, post I was just uh, interviewing uh, uh, Zion and I actually asked him to explain the classic two, power two, and modern two, the differences. And so, go yeah. ahead. <laughs> yeah. So, those are, those are, you know, those are phrases that I coined, you know, classic and modern mambo. And basically, uh, modern mambo, there's a couple ways. One, you use the one, uh, you could step on one. You say one, but you're really stepping on the end of eight. Right. Um, and, you know, those are the two ways of dancing, you know, dancing modern mambo. Um, so yeah, if you're, if you're teaching mambo per se, and you, and you use the one, you make the weight change on the one, then, then that point is moot, right? Because right. then you're connecting them right away. Right. If you're teaching them the old school modern mambo, and I say old school because, you know, before maybe the year 2000, maybe, right? In my opinion, modern mambo begins with uh, Eddie Torres, right? Right. In my opinion, in his, in his counting, and the teachers that followed him afterwards for a good 10 years, we're saying one, two, three, five, six, seven. But when you sing one, it's not actually one, right? You're right, saying it before right. one, occur one occurs. And so um, I used to always joke, you know, it's easier to say, you know, one than say eight and a half, two, three, four and a half, six, seven, you know. <laughs> and then at tempo, you know, your tongue will explode, you know, and then, you know. Yeah. <clears throat> so, but um, yeah, teaching people to understand where the one is. Uh, if they're not familiar with music, then you've got to lead them by the hand, you know, figuratively. And using the one 
uh, makes that, you know, possible and makes it easier for them. That's why it's easy to teach people to dance on one, you know, that break on one. Whereas modern mambo, you're stepping the one in a passive way, right? It's in between the, the break steps. Correct, yeah. So, yeah. you know, it's in between the core rhythms. So, you know, you precede the core rhythm with, you know, one or five, you know? So, yeah, to answer your question, I think it's for beginners, it's important to, you know, illustrate or have them follow you with dancing, using the weight change on the first beat of the bar or five. All right. But after a while, if you're really, if you want your, if you want your community, your dancers, your followers, your constituents to, to, to do other things, then you introduce these other things and let them, let them make that choice. Right. So uh, how is the social dancing in New York? Is it happening right now? Well, you know, pandemic, you know, people are still trying to- You guys still on phase two or phase one? To be honest, I don't even, I don't know what we're on. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, like, I, I'm good. I'm home, you know, uh, you know, I have, you know, I'm also a personal trainer, so I have one client and I'm, I train him twice a week. Good, good. And that's the only time, that's the only time I really leave the house. Yeah. I, you know, I, I go, I train him, you know, out in the street, you know, out, you know, on a sidewalk somewhere, sometimes in the park. Then I go do my grocery shopping and I come home. <laughs> yeah, I, I do the same thing here, man. I'm like, yeah. I go to Walmart or Costco or I go to the gym. That's it. I don't do anything yeah. else, dude. You know, uh, no, my gym is here. Yeah. Good for you. My gym is here. Yeah. I mean, my gym, I mean, we're on phase three. So that means okay. a, gym can, a gym or martial arts studios can open, but they would need to wear a mask and all of that stuff. But, right. uh, you know, it's a specialized type of membership where you could work out at any time. And so I would go there when there's no one is there. We're talking about 12 a.m., 1 a.m., dude. You know, wow. I don't have to wow. wear a mask. You know? <laughs> but, no, that's cool. Hold on, hold on just a second. I'm yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, maybe to help out. Making me hungry. Yeah, a little bit of light because I was like. <laughs> uh, light's cool. Um, so nothing in New York, dude. I, what the hell? And no festivals. Again, that sucks. I mean, that really sucks, dude. Have you ever tried this online classes? Uh, does it work? I think it does work for those who want to. Uh, I haven't done any, but. Uh, I think it'd be great know, for your musicality class, in my opinion, and they could probably record it. I don't know. Well, I already have an online course, yeah. you know? Oh, that's Everything, true. Yeah, all my stuff is online. In fact, I'm changing platforms soon, so. It may not be available uh, come the end of this month. It won't be available. And uh, what's your website nowadays? It's still mamafellow.com. Uh, okay. But uh, it may change. Uh, I hope not, but it may change because I have, I have to, you know, I'm using this platform and I'm using Kajabi as my platform uh, to present my material. And yeah. it's way too expensive for me. I can't afford it. So, um, you know, it's coming up. My annual, you know, thing is coming up. And, um, you know, right now, because of pandemic and all that, I'm just barely, you know, staying on track, you know, financially. So it's, uh, it sucks in that regard. Or but my note, material, man. my material is going to be, uh, I'm, I'm actually in the, in the very beginning stages of getting that information transferred somewhere else where people can, you know, view it participate and get it but right now it's still on mamafellow.com you can go there you can you know check them out there is a free course how to dance on two like the pros nice and uh it's, it's basically an excerpt from one from my uh from my uh salsa music rhythm phasing and timing uh classes the salsa uh salsa rhythm for dancers seminar so you ever, you ever uh did you ever get an idea to write a book uh, right now you could do ebook on Amazon and all that stuff <laughs> it, it's funny it's, just, it's funny that you say that because I had a conversation just yesterday with my <laughs> girlfriend and we were, and I was talking about all the things since since I arrived just only only all the things that happened 
just while I was in LA. Right. Forget about the stuff prior and forget about the stuff after. Just all the things that I went through and all the things that I experienced in LA relative to salsa. And and and, and right at the end of it, I said, I can, write, I can write a book on that. <laughs> <laughs> just on that alone. <laughs> just on that alone, you know? And I'm seriously contemplating that, you know, just to talk about, you know, what the environment was and, and how it looked and how it felt and my experience as an on cue dancer in you know, kind of like a stranger in a strange land, you know? And, uh, yeah, man. I mean, yeah, if, if I, I were if to I write do, a book on my salsa gang days, bro, oh, talking about, cool. talking about all tell all, no, no holds barred shit. Oh, Not oh, only oh. I'll be hated, but I'll sell a lot of books. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to name names. No, <laughs> oh, no man. Ooh, be careful. but, be careful. uh, Mambo Conference is one of the festival in the old days that I really enjoy, bro. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. Talking about 100% on two environment, right? And, yeah. and, 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 and the pros at that time dances with everyone. I had such a great time in that Congress with me nice. and Jean. And even you remember Christiane? Christiane was there too. And it, like, yeah. Christiane yeah, from Mambo wow. Romero. <laughs> At yeah, that time, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's like, yeah, yeah. it was like such a, I could never forget that festival. I think you did it in two years, right? For two years, right? I did, yes. Yeah. I think it was 2000 and 2001. Uh, the yeah. second year was nice because I had, it, had it in the hotel the second year. The first year I had it at this big dance, co dance studio complex. Uh, but we had to shut down by 12 30. it was odd but uh um, yeah i it was, know it was it was good and uh yeah even to the fact where um you know i had um uh, i had um uh, i can't remember their names now but the bands that the two bands i had yeah you, you know, had two, you had two bands there yeah right right one each night and uh the first one was johnny polanco of course. Right? And, uh, and then I had um, Freddie Crespo and the Mamba Review. That's who it was. And um, yeah, it was, a, it was a beautiful night. And, um, but that weekend was nice too. Everything, every workshop was on two, except for Rumba, of course, because Rumba is not on two. Right. Uh, and um, and on both uh, both events, it started with my class. So I, you know, every class was up with an hour and a half. And uh, but before every day, there was no other classes at the head of the thing, but the salsa rhythm for dancers class. So everybody got a taste and understood what the onto experience was relative to music and rhythm. Yeah, it was a good experience. I couldn't do it again though because it was just uh, I understand how it is and my. Compared to how, what you're doing or what other promoters and event producers are doing, mine was very small, small and intimate. I think I had slightly over 300 people the second year, you know? Yeah, but that's, but what, it, made, you know, that's what made it good, dude. I mean, the intimacy, the uh, not too much people, uh, that's what made it good. It was a quality type of festival in quality type of social dancing, you know? Yeah. And I really enjoyed that. And that's what I wanted to do for, to be honest with you, that's what I wanted to do for Mambo Expo, just to bring back the old format, but at the same time, modernized it in the, in, in the same way. Uh, right. Not too, not too big, not too small, but just the right place and, and the right amount of people, you know. <laughs> yeah. It it's a good idea, but, you know, yeah. it's not it, dead yet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I hear you. I hear you. I mean, there's a lot of there was a lot of interaction uh, between the participants, the, the attendees. Uh, you know, because of the intimacy, dance yeah. floor was crowded. Yeah, you know, it was nice. I mean, not not so crowded. You couldn't dance, but it wasn't empty. It wasn't an empty spot. You know, and what I like too, especially, um, I I was hoping, and I think I succeeded in joining the West Coast community because it was it's it true. Was Southern California Mambo Conference and and that's what they call in Southern California. They we were slowly embracing it. They were slowly embracing the Mambo phenomena, you know. Right. So it was uh it was fun. It was a lot of fun in that regard, you know. But I couldn't I couldn't do it following years. I just couldn't afford to do it. I uh, I barely scraped by in fact 
had it not been a few, there were a few uh, instructors that, uh, you know, wouldn't take money from me. They just said, you know, we were glad to do this. You know, I was, I was like, you know, very emotional about it, you know? And, well, that's, uh, that's, that's the beauty of promoting, bro, because you get to know the people who are really passionate about the dance. And mm -hmm. you get to know the people who really wants to support you, you know? <laughs> Right, right, right. <laughs> so, right. Yeah. Uh, that's the thing about promotion. There's a, there's pros and cons, and yes, most of the time you would lose money. <laughs> yeah, or be ill, or be you know injured, or whatever. Yeah. You know, yeah. there's a there's a lot of behind the scenes that people don't see. And and again, my part was very minuscule compared to the big events that you know uh, that have catered to thousands of attendees. You know. Uh, but I understand the struggle, you know, and I understand, you know, what it takes, again, on a small scale, what it takes to put an event together and to, you know, um, connect all the dots, you know. It's a daunting and, task. And that's uh, just for, a small scale, if you, if you know what I mean. I mean, right, exactly. some people organize as big ones. I organize six. Some people organize uh, really big ones. You have to admit, they're a little crazy. <laughs> Yeah, I think you have to have a little, you, you have to have a little screw loose, <laughs> you know, you do, you kind of have to, it's in your favor to be yeah. a little nuts, yeah. you know, <laughs> just to, you know, just to put it together, you know, yeah. but uh, so yeah, I, I respect everyone who tries to make an event happen, you know, and, uh, and I try in any way I can, I try to support, you know, even now, like, like, there were a couple of events, you know, like uh, uh, El, um, you know, Edwin Rivera's event that he had a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. And uh, uh, Sigue El Sol was his event. And, uh, you know, I, I thoroughly, you know, supported that and, you know, tried to help promote and, and things like that. Or this girl, uh, Carmen Gain, you know, uh, out east where she had the, the Brilliance Expo she had last weekend. And uh, I got... <laughs> I got, I never won anything in my life, but I won a free ticket and which was nice, but I get, you know, I donated to someone in LA, in fact. Good. Um, and so, you know, these things need to keep going. You know, we just need to make them happen, uh, especially the ones that have, you know, uh, qualitative, um, you know, content, you know, not just your everyday you know, uh, and, and I'm not putting them down, you know, not your everyday shines or partner or this or that, but other material, you know, um, you know, uh, speaking about, like, you know, uh, putting events together uh, about, you know, uh, what DJs have to do to make things work, you know, the good DJs and, you know, and other topics, you know, women in, you know, little uh, uh, panel discussions, you know, uh, women or black women in salsa, you know, uh, you know, talking about, um, you know, inappropriate behavior by, you know, men with women at these events, you know, whether they're, you know, uh, attendees or, you know, instructors, you know, these issues are important to know, to, to, to be exposed and to be, you know, talked about, you know, that there should be, and there is ongoing discussions about that. So I support all that. And I, I think it's great that even though we're kind of playing it safe, you know, with the pandemic, which is cool, but that we're still trying to make that connection and talking about real issues. Yeah. You know, re That's real true. things. Look, so did, you grow, did you grow up in New York? Were you born there? Yeah, born and raised. Uh, in fact, I, I didn't leave until I joined the Air Force at 20. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, how'd you get into you know, dancing then? Did you, how'd you learn it? Well, you know, New York, you know, the radio is a, a wonderful thing. And of course, a lot of New Yorkers are eclectic when it comes to music. So, you know, yeah. you have, you know, R&B and, and, and you have, you know, the Latin stations and you have the pop music and all that, even before it was called pop. And, uh, but then after a while, going to parties, house parties and other events. But I remember in elementary school, um, I was, uh, I don't know how I got in it, but there was a, a, a um, I guess it was for a performance for the students. And, and mm -hmm. we learned six dances. We learned like, this had nothing to do with salsa. I'm just, yeah. you know, yeah. but uh, we learned like the walls, we learned some foxtrot, we learned, we learned um, uh, some kind of, uh, 
Irish jig. Uh, you know, it was like it was uh, like six uh, dances, and then and then we performed each one. I think there was even tango, and we performed each one at a school, you know, uh, event. Mm. But after that, though, um, when it came to salsa, and I was a teenager, you know, I was getting into trouble and all that, and you know, uh, going to you know what they call hooky sets, you know, hooky parties, leaving school to go to these parties. And although most of the time it was, you know, slow music, you know, you're grinding or whatever, <laughs> there was also salsa. And so um, salsa was starting to become for me at like 13, 14 and, and up, especially like listening to the radio stations in New York uh, with DJs like, um, what was his name? Uh, DJ Sugar something. Can you remember their names now? They were on they were on AM stations, mm. and uh, and they were they were only on for like a couple of hours. But we would you know we would dance to that and uh, and then going to the park and dancing with each other. And then um, when I got older, you know, we were starting to go to the clubs. Hustle was big at the time, though. Yes, yes. And um, so salsa was kind of. Salsa wasn't dead, but salsa was not really, you know, out in the forefront. And I remember going to clubs. There was one club on 73rd Street and Broadway in the old, in, in the Ansonia. It's not a hotel anymore, but it used to be the Ansonia Hotel. In the basement uh, was Casablanca, the first iteration of Casablanca. And they played salsa there. And I lived like a half a mile away. And uh, so I would go there and I'd be dancing. By the time I went to the Air Force, I was dancing salsa a lot. Because I would be playing the music or whatever. I'd be dancing with people that I knew. And, um, you know, do you think that was that, my beginnings. Do you think that mambo and salsa, uh, do you think that uh, uh, hustle has a lot of influence to salsa? Absolutely. Yeah, the hustle is a big influencer, especially on, <clears throat> you know, crossbody lead. Mm -hmm. There was, there was no cross, it was circular before Hustle. Right. Then the Hustle came by and, you know, a lot of us at that time were, like when I was going to college, you know, uh, where I was also dancing salsa, um, the Hustle and, 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 but let me put it this way. We go to, you know, we'd be invited to a party. Oh yeah, what's, you know, what kind of music? Oh, it's either... They would either say rap, yeah. Uh, uh, they would say rock, R and B, or Latin. That was it. So R and B was anything done by a black group. Yeah. Rock was anything done by a white group. Right. And Latin, of course, is Latin, which was salsa. And so the hustle was starting to come up, and it, it hadn't changed yet then. Um, it was starting to, it was starting to infiltrate. Because when I learned how to, how to do crossbody lead, I remember this guy, I'll never forget him, his name is George. He's a really ugly dude, but he was very <laughs> popular at the dance, at, you know, they used to have dance socials at the college. And George was very popular because he could dance. And he was dancing with that, that part of the crossbody lead where you're making the turn, you know, that, that half turn. Right. Right. So, and so, we got that. I was like, oh, that's cool. That's, that's nice, you know? And if, and if you lead somebody that way, and the women followed really well. Absolutely. So, uh, but it was amorphous as far as timing was. One, three, five, whatever, you know. Um, so, yeah, I think the hustle and then also the turn figures, even though there were turns, you know, usually one or two turns, not these uh, intricate turn patterns that were actually being done in hustle, but the hustle was borrowing from salsa as well, you know, for its flavor and the way that they were doing turns. So it was, <coughs> it, was a, it was a good influence, you know. But the hustle helped make salsa what it is today, you know. Yeah. Give me your top five salsa band. Oh my goodness! You can only pick five. Yeah, top five. No, I'm saying E because I'm really bad with names of, of bands, especially. And and I am not even current with any of the 
you know, the current band. They're really the, they're I, really not that current, bro. There's there's really no, nothing. <laughs> no, no, there is there, there are like there's a there's a band here in New York called uh Avenida Bay. Really? <laughs> yeah, Avenue B. Smoking hot. No dude, Really? These guys Yeah. They did they did something uh <clears throat> David Frankel, who's the leader of the of the band, cool dude, man. I really like him. Good energy. I love I love the guy. And uh, you know, he spent time listening to people, plus his own personal preferences about music. Yeah. So when his band when his band first started, I want to say maybe seven or eight years ago, give or take a year, he made sure that the songs were not longer than five minutes that they were energetic, that, you know, um, that they were hard, you know? And uh, if you look them up, they got a couple albums out. The music is nice. Wow. Really nice. I gotta, I look, really like I gotta look them up, because I've never heard of them. Look at, in fact, you should hire them for one of your events. Interesting. They're that good. How, many, good. how many people are in the band? Uh, it changes, but I think there's um, I think there's about eight. Okay. Okay. You know, but they 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 change the penny because one time I saw him at a small venue and he had like maybe five people. So you know, they 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 adjust to the venue and to budgets and all that. You know. Of course. But uh, yeah. but it, but uh, let me tell you, it's a quality it's a quality group. Yeah. Uh, um, Boogaloo Assassins, I like because you know some of their music really gets to me i don't know a lot of their music but it just comes to the front of my mind because when i hear them I'm like oh yeah they are even though i've never seen them live yeah it bothers me because they came out after i left LA. i love their songs bro i love their songs yeah yeah they're, they're good you know so this is for me that's that's current there's probably a couple more but i can't recall but then you know you go back to of course you know you go back to like there's a lot of music I like from Tito. Once nice. they end Tito, you know, Tito uh, Rodriguez, you know, right, too right. awesome. And then, you know, um, um, Romeo Santos? No, 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 no. Another, <laughs> another, another old, <laughs> another old school. Uh, I don't know why, I don't know what, I'm having a senior moment right now. That's okay. Um, Okay. But uh, yeah, um, it'll come to me. Can you explain um, to me a little bit about boogaloo? The term boogaloo. What the hell does that mean? Because when I think of boogaloo, I'm thinking of cha cha ish. You know, well, boogaloo was its own genre back in the '60s. Right. I don't know a lot about it. You know, frankly, myself. Right. Because uh, when I, I think of it, boogaloo, it's like cha cha ish. Mm -hmm. One of the one of that popular band would, wait, was hit by a Filipino guy, you know? I forgot his name. Right. Yeah. Oh, you're right. talking about uh, uh, um, uh, Joe Batan. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, Boogaloo is like, it's kind of a marriage between like soul and Latin music. Right. Uh, uh, and sometimes some of, there were a lot of Boogaloo bl uh, bands that were not versed in clave, so there was no clave. Right. But it felt like it felt like cha cha. Or it felt you know had a right. cha cha feel to it, you know. But it was upbeat, you know. And, but not cha cha. Cha cha has a different feel. Cha 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 has a different feel. A little bit, clave, yeah. Of course. yeah. But boogaloo is more soul influenced, you know. There used to be a boogaloo dance too. I don't, I don't know it, but uh, um, and some people even have taught it, you know. Yeah. The dance boogaloo, yeah. Yeah. But it's it's a throwback to the to the sixties, and um, yeah, they're they're you know like what are they called? The Boogaloo Brothers? No, the uh, uh, there were these brothers. Uh, I tell you, I, like I said, I don't remember names too well. <laughs> That's okay. So when you DJ, do you still play cha cha cha? I haven't DJed in a while, but I did play uh, cha cha cha. Yes, you know, that's missing now, dude. It's no one's playing that shit anymore. Um well, my experience here in New York is that they are. Yeah, they Not, should. They at, at yeah, every they, salsa congress should. 
They should, yes, they should. Um, because uh, what, for one thing, it's a good way to slow things down. Right. Even though it feels, even though it feels fast, you can still play a cha-cha, a real cha-cha-cha, not not like uh, not like guajira. Right. Right. People are dancing cha-cha-cha to guajira, <laughs> and sometimes some some, some slow some montunos, but um, real cha-cha-cha, you know. Um, but I think it's good. I think it's good to exercise that side of the Latin fence that's still in clave and um, and still is a cha 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 is happy music, you know, where Guajira yeah. Guajira is more, you know, uh, lamenting music, you know. Um, but still you great could really to, you could really jam your footwork there in, in cha 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 and do a lot of body movements as opposed to, you know, the regular salsa which is a little faster and I do feel it more, to be honest with you. So, um, you know, yeah, I, 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 miss it. I miss it. Yeah, well, you got to start getting DJs that will that will play that. Here in New York, uh, there, so the venues that I go, go to, they play, but then they also play, you know, bachata, which I I sit down. You know, I'm not really a, ah. I'm not a bachatero. You know, <laughs> I have I have trauma. You know, so. What? Like, I mean, don't you, you guess, don't you used to get annoyed? You go to a salsa place and they used to play a lot of merengue? <laughs> uh, yes, yes. But I didn't, mind it if they, I didn't mind it if they played a little bit of merengue. Well, just a little bit, yeah. Yeah, if they played like two or three songs, that's fine. If they played five or six songs, you know, and the same thing with bachata, you know. Uh, you know, I, me, myself, I want to go out there, I want to dance mambo, that's really my own personal yeah, that depends on the environment and the way it's advertised and uh the dj yeah. should should know enough to know to to be what the majority of the dancer is in in that in that crowd and right. the the very fact that the way it advertised you know the dj should know that so that he would know what which type of songs to play you know? yeah yeah i i agree with that that's like uh one dj here is uh, that I really like. In my opinion, he's the best for a lot of reasons. Is uh, Babalu, mm. DJ Babalu. You know, he um, one uh, he understands um, how to move the crowd with music. Two, he knows how to EQ the music too. He just doesn't play music to play music. And then, because you know, not every record is mastered the same way. So the volume levels a lot of times need adjustment, and he and he adjusts everything to its sweet spot. I, I sometimes I would go and I would stand in the booth with him and just just listen to the music while he's playing, you know. Uh, and he's not blasting the music either, you know. It's at a comfortable hearing level where yeah. you dance and you could you could actually converse with someone. You know, you're not losing your hearing. At his, I mean, it's not low but it's loud enough where it needs to be loud. And I think that that's important in a DJ to have those, those three elements, you know? So it is now 2020, right? Which, what a year. But back then when you were just started teaching salsa. So let's talk beginner student for, for a moment here. Okay. Your methodology of teaching, I'm sure, were different then to now. What do you think made that difference and why do, would you change certain methodologies of teaching beginners? You're talking about dance classes or, or rhythm? Dance classes, dance. yeah. Um, you know, when I was teaching dance, I was, I was actually learning how to teach, you know? You learn, and, you learn as you teach, as you know, yeah. Yeah, yeah, of course. And, and the best teachers you know, are students. But what I'm saying is that I hadn't, when I first started teaching, I, I didn't have anybody to tell me how to teach. So I was making mistakes and right. I was, you know, and I was learning how to, uh, I think I've always been personable. So that was not an issue, you know? Right. I think that, you know, I always, I, I always could hold attention in the class and, you know, make jokes and, you know, just, you know, keep it light, you know? I was not a taskmaster, so I wasn't one to like, you know, you know, uh, try to, you know, uh, break you to make you, you know, kind of thing. But I think that, um, I, I think that 
teaching is really kind of an amorphous thing. It can, it can be amorphous, you know, depending on what, what end result you want from your constituents. You right. know, if, if, you want, if you want them to just make it, just enough to make it, or you want to challenge them, then you introduce information that gives them that ability. But then you have to, okay, so for teachers in general, this is not just in dance, I think, I think this is true anywhere. You have, to, you have to teach to the room. You can't just go in there and say, this is how I teach. And right. if you get it, you get it. And if you don't, too bad. Right. Because you got people who have no clue. They're like scratching their head the first 10 minutes. You have people that not only got it, but are starting to get bored and waiting for you to get to the next thing. Let's hurry up and get to the, I want to get to this part. And then you got the people who just got it and are just, are just doing a thing. Yeah. You have to navigate this room every single time you teach. At every single time, you know? So that's why, like, for me, eventually, I made sure that I gave people the opportunity to input um, their queries. You know, if they have a question or whatever, give them an opportunity and not just fly by through everything. And then they leave the, they leave the room. They're like, what the hell just happened here? <laughs> I don't even know. Uh, uh, I would have to take this class again, you know? And, right. you know, I don't want to do that. You know, I don't want to force somebody to come back and take it like, unless you want to, you know, take it again <laughs> just to help hone it in. But, you know, when you leave, you should, you should get, you know, 80% of what I, you know, that's my hope, you know, and I hope to do that by practicing my delivery. Yeah. You know? Has uh, a student ever asked you for a private lessons when it comes to musicality? Because I know it's a little different teaching it in a group, not to private, right? Yeah, I've had many privates. Yeah, in person, you know, Skype, whatever. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's uh, it's easier when it's private, right? Because um, you don't have to teach the room. You just got one person. Sure. Sure. <laughs> you yeah. know, and yeah. and when I when I teach the room rhythm, every question I take every question, and I tell them, no question is stupid. So whatever's in your head, when it pops in your head throw your hand up. I'll stop and I'll answer your question because I want you to get, this is not easy material. Yeah. And even though, so, you know, at a Congress, most times it's two, sometimes three hours, depending, you know, if I can finagle it and I have them put me like near the lunch hour, then I say, Hey, you know, lunch is coming up, but I got more to teach. So if you want to stay, you know, that's free time on me and that's more time for them, but I want them to get this information, you know? Yeah. Uh, but even in that amount of time, that's a lot of information. And I want them to be able to walk away to go, okay, I, whew, there are a lot of stuff, but I understand the concept, whatever, this or that. I got to practice. Otherwise, I'm going to forget, you know. And of course, you know, they come back to my material to help reinforce the information they learned in, in that thing. But, you know, um, I think it's important um, to convey something to someone so that they get it and that it's uh, not like, you know, it's like super science, you know? How important is it, you think, for all levels of dancers uh, learning more about the musicality and instruments and, and other stuff in, in, the, in the salsa music itself? How important is it for their growth? Um, that's a great question. Um, I, I think, but there's not one real answer, true answer, because one, it's, I feel that not just my material, but any material, it's only important when it's important to you. Right? Like, you have to want to know this. But stuff. don't you think it enhances their dancing? Well, getting to that, uh, I think so. I think too that there are people that have an innate, an innate understanding or an innate feeling about certain things, so that when you present it to them, they get it done fast. You know? Yeah. So like, okay, this is what's happening here. Oh yeah, there. Right. Okay. Next. And then we move along really quickly. Yeah, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I'm talking about like. Uh, 
and this doesn't happen with all pros because some pros still don't, you know, don't get it in the beginning. But there's a, there's a healthy amount of pros that when they get it, you know, when, it, when it's presented, they get it right away. Right away, you know? yeah. And, yeah. And, then, and then they start to, they start to use this information for their own personal use. Exactly. Their professional use, you know? Yeah. Um, and when it comes to even people who don't dance, I had a, I had a, I was teaching a series of classes for uh, Biel Canela, mm. and they have, they have, uh, they're connected with, I forget which college, some, some higher learning uh, institution in New York. So they would get people from the colleges to take dance classes and stuff like that. So when my class came up, which was split in two, right? They come at, you know, two weekends and then they, you know, I teach the seminar. And I had people that weren't even dancing yet mm. asking really pointed questions, <laughs> you That's know, good. that made sense. And they weren't yeah. even dancing yet. Right. You know, so uh, to answer your question, I think it's important for everyone when they feel that it's important for them. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Well, there, 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 there it is. Now, um, I know that you know, a lot of people go to New York, but they don't know where to go when it comes to social dancing. Before pandemic, what were your favorite club or studio to dance with? Socials. And tons right. of people doing it, right? Yeah, there are a lot of socials. Um, oh, okay. um, and the funny thing, too, is that there are, there are about three or four socials done in the same venue. <laughs> Just Are you serious, time. really? <laughs> I'm serious, yeah. Like Jimmy Anton yeah. social is in, uh, um, um, I think it's called Stepping Out. Is that, is that always on Sundays? Uh, yeah, I think it's like, I forget what, what Sundays they are. Yeah, like the yeah. first and third, and then they alternate with like um, uh, LVG, you know? Mm. Mm. And LVG is also in the same venue. There's also, um, uh, what's this other? This one done by uh, Nelson Flores. Um, oh, Nelson Flores has socials now. Okay. Yeah, he has. A, yeah, he has a social. I think it's called uh, Descarga something. I'm sure it has to have discargas it somehow. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> That's his brand. <laughs> right, exactly. And then there's another one in the same venue. Um, I forget the name of it. But they're all in the same venue. So sometimes it doesn't have a... For me, sometimes it loses that special feeling because it's the same venue, you know? Yeah, I agree. Days, I agree. Different yeah. days, you know, like... Antonio, you know, uh, Antonio La Conga for LVG. Great DJ, plays great music, you know. Um, and uh, the other venue, I mean, the other socials have good music. Sometimes the music is too loud or, you know, whatever, you know. Uh, sometimes you have really great dancers, sometimes not, you know. But that's a, that's a good place to go, and, you know. And you have all these different social in the same location because a lot of studios closed you know studios that were like uh, where where jimmy anton used to have his social for a long time that that place closed down you know and um oh man that's when, yeah you know and then lvg used to be at a different place i think they got this place too because it was probably better for them localized and maybe cheaper for them i don't know but um and another uh, closed another, down there Huh? A lot of clubs has closed down there. I mean, there's no longer. There used to be a a, a thing there called Conga, and then there was a there was a venue where DJ Henry used to host. Of course, DJ Henry does not live there anymore. <laughs> yeah, it's about, uh, it's he lives in Henry Thailand knows. now. He's having fun, dude. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Henry knows. Yeah, yeah, he did a lot of places, but uh, there's another place called Taj. Uh, it's not one of my favorites, but it's it's popular. Uh -huh. um, Taj is, I think, uh, uh, Monday nights. Yeah. And uh, it's a really nice looking venue. They have live music. You know, is that in Manhattan? Nice. That's in Manhattan, like 23rd Street. I think it's 23rd Street. Uh, but Taj, it's called Taj. Yes. Like the Taj Mahal. But just right, Taj. right, right, right. Um, 
Another one is um, uh, Solas. That's the one with DJ Babalu is at. Yeah. Uh, uh, Wednesdays is when he plays. That's always nice. Um, and I can't really remember any any more, you know, because uh, there was a while that I hadn't been I hadn't been dancing. There was about a good two years I didn't go out dancing at all. So uh, I lost contact with a lot of stuff. You know? There's not much but here. You know, there's not much here in the Bay Area now. It's, I mean, it's not like yeah, the way before we had Cafe Kokomo and we had some clubs there. Uh, right. They have a thing here called I Heart Mambo, but they do it in the studio and it's not the same. Uh, yeah. So it, it, it's really hard to find a club that has 100% salsa. Uh, although Gabriel Romero was doing a Wednesday social there at one point and all the mambo dancers go there every Wednesday. Uh, it, it, it's a very small club called El Valenciano, but there, I can't find those, those type of clubs anymore like they used to be. And really, predominantly, it's bachata. Don't blame me for it, by the way. It's all bachata. <laughs> it's I'm all sure, bachata. I'm, so sure, <laughs> I'm sure you had some kind of influence in that. <laughs> <laughs> you, you know, they could call you the... You call it's you so like bachata. The, it's like, oh, the, shit. <laughs> you know. you, they, they'll call you the daddy, the daddy influencer <laughs> of the Bay Area. You know. Yeah, those were the days. But anyways, it's yeah. good to hang out with you, man. I mean, it's been a while. Same here, man. Because I was good hoping we would hang out this October, but it's not going to happen. I figure it's like, uh, let me let me talk to let me talk to Mike here and and podcast. One of the reasons I created this podcast so that I could really talk to uh, people like you and talk about old times and see what's up. Yeah, you know? <laughs> yeah. I remember the first time you 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 brought me when you brought me up. Um, What's his name? Um, that was a, I think we featured you at Metronome, I think. Yes, exactly. Yeah, Metronome. Yeah. And uh, yeah, with Ava. I usually work with Ava during that time, even when we uh, when she brought Frankie Martinez. You know, I I I I helped her out. You know, uh, advertising and all of that stuff. Right. Yeah. yeah. And Nelson Flores too. Yeah. Yeah, it's funny because like. When I first met Nelson, I was in LA, and it was the first year that I was actually working on salsa in LA. And um, he came out there. It was his team, Descarga Latina, and uh, and Addy Addy Diaz, right, uh, was part of his team at the time. Right. And I, and I have to say, the term the fr the term cross body lead I learned from her. Oh, really? I didn't know, <laughs> I didn't know what that was. And, you know, so um, it was a cool thing. You know, just, yeah, cross by lead, this is what we do, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, oh, I stuck around the class and watched how they taught, you know? And, uh, yeah, you know, uh, we, had, we had several people come through, like Luis Agarra that first year. We brought yeah. him out, you know? Yeah, yeah. And, um, yeah, it was, it was, uh, it was. Or uh, even Ismael. Ismael uh, uh, came here in California, too, at that time. Yeah, he, I mean, I, I never had him, but he was here. He came to the Congress, you know, yeah. you know the Congresses were here, very popular. Even his sister, because I don't know if you know about his sister. Yesenia. He's fierce. Yesenia, yeah. yeah. He's fierce. Dude, and, I'm, from, uh, I'm from old school. When you guys were just pros, I was just there taking down every note. I know every one of you, man. <laughs> <laughs> I believe you. <laughs> I believe you. That was, yes, like a, you. that was like a laser focus, dude. <laughs> Yeah, especially when you were doing, you know, Salsa Gang and all that and, you know, making a lot of posts. There now, would you believe, if, if we stuck to that website, man, we could have made something like Facebook or MySpace at that time. Our vision was just too narrow. That's the reason. Yeah, you could have started your own platform. That's, that, was I, I like, that. that was like the Facebook of the day, dude. <laughs> it, was, it was good. It was, the, it was like the Salsa, you know, it was the Salsa Facebook. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It was good. How long did you have it? For a couple of years, right? Oh, I've had it for at least probably five years, bro. Wow. And then... Uh, when it was active? When it was active? Oh, it was active. It was yeah. active. You know, people are still talking shit, you know. <laughs> right. And the four of which they love to do. But uh, yeah, right, it was right, to right. a point that uh, the founders, uh, there were three founders there, three Asians, really. Me, Eugene, and Lee. Uh, Chinese, Filipino, and Korean. <laughs> right. <laughs> You know, we just, um, we just couldn't do it anymore, you know. Eugene, yeah. 
You remember yeah. Eugene? <laughs> it was like, yeah. That is some humor he got there, dude. You just laugh your ass. Funny. Yeah, wow. <laughs> but uh, yeah, we'll 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 reunite again because I, I was really hoping you guys would be there. Frankie would be there, and Sion would be there, and some other great. Right. You know, Ava Apple will always be part of it, of course. Right. But, Did you have Magna as well? Yeah, and Magna as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I, had, I remember the uh, first time I met Magna. Yeah, was at my event. Oh, uh, really? Yeah, Edwin Rivera. He had he had taught at that event, hmm. and then one night it was like the second night, and uh, he pulled me over. He says, "Hey, you know, is it okay if I bring somebody?" And I go, "Yeah, sure." Yeah. And she was there already, <laughs> and he goes, "Yeah, this is Magna." And I'm like, "Oh my god," you know. And then cool. So then I saw her dancing, and I was like, "What?" I remember <laughs> she was wearing this light blue dress. It's so funny how you remember people. Yeah. Yeah, 2001. I think I met her around that time also. It was somewhere in Tacoma, Washington. It was a salsa congress. And then they, they actually invited me to teach bachata. I think that was the very first time I've ever taught bachata at a congress. <laughs> Wow. And they were already making fun of me at that time. <laughs> I was like, hey, hey, uh, uh, dude, are you Dominican? I was like, no, I'm Filipino. Why are you teaching bachata? <laughs> <laughs> it, was on, it was in an elevator in front of everyone, dude. I said, hey, dude, I said, dude, are you Puerto Rican? I was like, no, I'm Mexican. I'm Mexican. I was like, why are you teaching salsa, dude? <laughs> <laughs> just, Don't you know you're not supposed to be teaching that? We're just <laughs> fucking around, you know. <laughs> it right, was right, like right. funny as shit, but this were the days, wow. bro. Those were the days. Um, what's your uh, fun memories of the Salsa Congresses? Give me one or the two at least. The fun memories. Okay, one of the fun memories I have is Freddie Rios. I've known Freddie, uh, you know, I've known Freddie Rios since the 80s. Right. When I, uh, I was part of this little thing called the uh, Mambo Society. Right? Oh, I see. Yeah, I remember that society. Yeah. Yeah, Mambo Society, 1989. And... Um, and Eddie, I mean, uh, Freddie used to come by. In fact, after the Mambo Society kind of died out, he went with Angel Rodriguez when he started Razzmatazz. Right. But anyway, you know, Freddie Rios is a Mambo Nick from the super old school. Like, he's an like, OG. I mean, they, they're know. doing a lot of footwork there, man. I mean, it's like shit, you know? Let me tell you, he's one guy he could show any, any shine he could show in his fingers. He would yeah. get the shine, whatever. <laughs> And just spit out a shine, he would do it. Oh, man. So, so he, he would come to my booth. <laughs> and, you know, we talk for a while, you know, hang out, you know. And then he'd do, like, two or three shines, right? He, he, he'd be wanting to show me these two or three shines. Right. And then, so then somebody goes up to him, right? Other people are doing it behind him, like, they're following him. Oh, <laughs> great. And then they go, oh, can you, can you show me how to do that again? He's like. I'm showing him. I'm not showing you. <laughs> <laughs> like, you know. And then he'd leave. He goes, hey, can you, can you sell these DVDs for me or these tapes or whatever for me? <laughs> yeah, sure. Go ahead, go. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Uh, Freddie Rios, he's, uh, he's a character. But, you know, one of the legends, you know, one of the dance legends in Mambo. Um, what's, another, what's another funny story? Um, Damn, I can't even, uh, it's not so funny. This actually is not funny, but I was at the, I was at the uh, San Francisco Salsa Congress and uh, I had Dario was staying at the booth, you know, cause I like to go dance. Sometimes I just like to go watch cause I like watching people dance. Right. You know? And it was that year, I think it was the second year where, I don't know if you, you know, if you, were there or remember this, but the first year they had mostly on one instruction and performances. The second year was like the flip of that. It was like right. Chicago, uh, Chicago, did I say San Francisco? I meant Chicago. Chicago, yeah. Okay. Chicago, Chicago Congress just flipped in its evolution. They just shot up there, possibly because they were exposed to onto instructors and, and dance teams the first year and they were emulating and all that. So anyway, I wanted to go out there and watch people dance. And I'm, I'm standing on the sidelines. And this woman, I remember she was wearing a red dress. 
she asked me to dance. And I'm like, all right, cool. So I'm dancing with her. She's doing all this styling. <laughs> but Lying. she was like, all of that stuff. Yeah, wow. yeah, she was everything. And I was like, in my head, like, oh man, you know, and she wasn't even really on time. <laughs> I did a turn and she socked me in the face <laughs> with, with her elbow. Bam. And I was like, and she stood there, I, I dropped her hand. And I was like, really from that first, because she caught me right in the corner of the eye. Right. And I was, I, in my head, I'm going, black eye. <laughs> and, and I was like, okay, you need to slow down and just take it easy. I didn't quit on it. Right. I still, I still stayed. I danced with her, but then I went back to the booth and I was like, oh man. And I was cool. Uh, four days later, I got a black eye. I bet. I bet. It was like, Wow, why didn't I get it that night or the day, you know, but. I had some experience with that as far as being elbowed in the face as well by your partner. It's, I think it happened to, to all of us at one point, you know? Yeah, I've, 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 I've done it too, you know, sometimes a person comes in and I'm doing something and I kind of elbow them and I'm like, oh my God, it's the worst feeling in the world. Because sometimes most of the time the followers wants to get near your face and, and, sometimes that's not that shouldn't be the case and and sometimes you would think because you're not paying attention you're turning around all of a sudden you know their face your elbow cut their face you know it's yeah yeah but anyways uh dude uh we'll keep in touch i'll i'll keep yes. you updated with the mumbo expo uh awesome. don't forget ladies and gentlemen his website is mumbofellow.com that might change later on uh you befriend him on Facebook uh, under Mike yes. Bellow, I, be I believe, you know? Yes. So, by the way, that mumbofellow.com, ladies and gentlemen, there's no W. It's F E L L O. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you for saying that. That's, yeah. how you get, that's how you get Mike Bellow, the Mumbo Fellow. Mumbo Fellow. So, ladies and yeah. gentlemen, if you like this content, make sure you like and click like. And if you have not subscribed, make sure you subscribe. Have a good one, brother. It's good talking to you. Thank you. Same here, man. It was a pleasure. All right, bro.